Next. Let's talk about The Handmaiden, which is the new Let's. film from Park Chan-wook. Now, um, I think he's probably still best known over here for Old Boy, mm. from 2003. Uh, since then, he's of course, he's done other things, including Stoker's first English language film very recently, and also Thirst, this really weird, sort of religiously conscious vampire film, which was pretty good. Um, this, I think, is his most accessible film that I've seen. I think I've seen everything that he's done, and this is even more accessible than Old Boy. Even though, and I'm approaching this film with my heart in my mouth, because it is, I mean, it's an erotic thriller that I think you would say contains some fairly robustly conjugal activity. And, you know, we're going to have to choose our words very carefully in describing it. It's an adaptation, actually, of um, a novel called Fingersmith by Sarah Waters, uh, which was set in Victorian Britain. It has transposed to um, Japanese-occupied Korea in, in, in the first part of the 20th century much more effectively than you could have possibly imagined. I think, you know, it's um, it, it fits the park aesthetic very, very well. Um, you've got, so it, it's set in this sprawling mansion that is an amalgamation of Western Gothic architecture and classical Japanese architecture, both sort of bolted together, where you have, um, living in the mansion, there's uh, Hideko, who's this, um, Hideko, sorry, who's this uh, Japanese heiress who is very kind of vulnerable and slightly in the thrall of her uncle Kozuki. Um, they're played by Kim Min-hee and uh, Cho jun Woon. And to this scene arrive two con artists, uh, one of them uh, called Suki, who's a young Korean woman who's hired as Hideko's handmaiden, played by Kim Tai-ri. And the other one is this guy, a, a really seasoned con artist called Count Fujiwara, which is his sort of stage name, played by Ha jung woo And the plan is that he will come in and seduce Hideko and, there, and thereby, with um, with the handmaiden's assistance, so she, you know, when Kent Fujiwara is not there, will reassure Hideko that you know this guy is really he nice. You. He loves you. He's really into you. This is a wonderful match made in heaven. They get married. He then has Hideko committed to an insane asylum, and then he can abscond with her inheritance. That's the plan. Now, to say any more than that, don't is would be a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because the joy of this film, the supreme pleasure of watching it, is that the plot is this. So magnificently engineered whirring contraption. And it's like when you're confronted by one of these crazy clocks in a museum where there are cogs upon cogs upon cogs and you're just watching this stuff spinning around, just entranced by how well it fits together. Mm. That's what watching The Handmaiden is like. You know, it is an erotic thriller. Uh, it very heavily skews towards the fetish side of things. There's lots of voyeurism. This is an, a, a, a persistent idea in this film is that people are their true selves when they are on their own and not aware of being watched. So you have a lot of people peeping through windows from behind curtains, through screens, people revealing themselves physically, but also emotionally, or perhaps performing a strip tease that you believe reveals more than it actually does. If you've seen Old Boy, you will know that Park is not averse to some stomach-churning rug pulls throughout his films. There's nothing to quite match Old Boy's final, oh my goodness, head and hands moment here. Yeah. However, you will notice, and the, the performances are exquisitely detailed, you will notice seeds being sown very early on, little mannerisms. Um, Suki has a very strange laugh, and you think, well, why? You know, she's meant to be this quite cunning, yeah. uh, manipulative character. Why does she have this very sort of odd, gullible, guileless laugh? You know, she's kind of like... <laughs> 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 and it's hard, it's hard to explain without yeah, explaining why, quite, but... Yeah. Those sort of mannerisms and micro behaviours are all very cleverly mapped out so they will pay off later. And actually about a third of the way into the film, there's a wonderful moment where the whole plot just kind of goes whoop, yeah. upside down. It takes your breath away. It does. It really does. Um, My goodness, it's a sexy film. It is, it, it is sexy. But, but I, not, in a, not in a kind of, a kind of gratuitous kind of, uh, you used the word erotic and I wouldn't even describe it as erotic. It's kind of, it's so tender and beautiful and stylish. And I think those scenes, I looking at them, they feel like, kind of like you're looking at raw chicken through a kaleidoscope. It's just like kind of, you know, flesh sort of turning and being... <laughs> the use of the it's word. maybe... Raw, raw chicken. It's maybe it's more, raw... It's more, it's more appealing than I'm giving it credit for. <laughs> yeah. That's a, okay, poor choice. Forget I said that. Okay. <laughs> Remove the image but of raw it chicken. Is, <laughs> it is aestheticised in the extreme. There are actually, there's two photographers, uh, Ren Hang and Nobuyoshi Araki, um, whose work, I think this is probably very consciously influenced by, before you Google these names, you know, know that their photography is screamingly NSFW. But I yeah. think if you've seen The Handmaiden and you're kind of okay with that strength of imagery, then it's, it's, it's worth looking these photographers up because that's the kind of tradition that Park's working in. He's also working 
in an overtly gothic tradition. You know, there are echoes of Hitchcock's Rebecca here. In the structuring of this incredible mansion, there are these power cuts that ripple through the building as if the building is a living organism, sort of breathing and coughing with these people inside it. You've also, like the um, uh, the Bates Motel house yeah. in, um, in, in Cycle, the house is kind of structured. So you have on the ground floor, the, it's, it represents the eagle, the bedrooms are the super eagle, down in the basement, basement. the churning id, and it's this yeah. mediation between control and desire and how these two things are reconciled. This is all very vague stuff. And the reason it's vague you is because to be. to, you have to be, because to give away more would be to spoil it. But this is, you know, it's it's a very, very enjoyable film. It's incredibly accessible. It's it's also, you know, it's it's strong stuff. Yeah. But, you know, the, the abiding sense that I had when I came out was not that I'd been shocked or no. offended, but it was just, my goodness, what a story. It's beautiful. And the idea as well that it's based on the novel, which was set in London, but you can't, the, the film would not have been as powerful or effective if it had been set here. It needed that culture and that setting and that kind of, that delicateness that you get with those cultures from uh, you know, Korea and, and, and Japan as well to, to really influence it as well aesthetically. And I think sp specifically the joining together of mm. Western and Eastern styles, you know, in the house, the fact that half of it is, got, you know, European Gothic, half of it is classical Japanese. In the rooms, you have this mixture of, you know, there's, there's some Japanese wallpaper, there's some Western wallpaper, you know, the furniture, everything is this amalgamation, this uneasy but beautiful alliance. Mm. That's what the film is about, uneasy but beautiful alliances. I wanted all the costumes and you wanted all the wallpaper.